Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome back to another webinar. And this time is our second session uh, with uh, in a series of many with Beacon Hospital. And one CPD point will be awarded. And we have here Dr. Tan, um, who is a gynecologist, a, a colleague of mine in Beacon. And he also has his own fertility center uh, in Subang Jaya, if I'm not mistaken, right, uh, Dr. Tan? Oh, okay. So, Chiu, um, without further ado, we invite him to give us more insight into common gynecological dis diseases. Thank you, everyone, for participating in this webinar. Let's just start the webinar uh, without further delay. Um, I try to cover as much as possible for the gyne common gynecological disease. I'm a Dr. Tan, I'm a chief obstetrician and gynecologist, also minimal evasive surgeon, uh, specialized in fertility. Um, our outline is actually anatomy, reproductive function and physiology. How do we, how, uh, we use the ovulation induction agent? Uh, how do we detect ectopic pregnancy? Uh, polycystic ovarian uh, uh, disease. Uh, Bartholin cyst, labia abscess management, amenorrhagia, uterine fibro, adenomyosis, polyps, ovarian cyst, and also cyst, uh, cervicitis and PID. Also, how to um, manage the cervical intraepithelial lesion, with, uh, uh, um, which is abnormal. All right, if we have time, then we talk about vaginal discharge. So this is our uh, female reproductive organ. You have the external major lab um, my, uh, uh, labia minora and also majora, then this is a vagina opening. So this inside, inside this vagina opening, about eight, eight to 10 cm, you have the cervix. The whole organ is a uterus. There's two fallopian tubes and two ovaries. The function of the vagina is for reproductive function and also uh, part of the birth canal. Um, the uterus is to house the fetus and also to nourish the fetus. The fallopian tube is a place where the sperms fertilize the eggs, which also facil uh, uh, facilitate the um, uh, fertilization. Ovaries contain of germ cell, which actually control our female hormone, estrogen and progesterone, and also um, to produce eggs for uh, to pass the genetic material to the uh, next generation. So um, at this, there's a battling gland at the five o'clock and seven o'clock near the uh, posterior fauche. There's a uh, vagina opening, urethra and clitoris. There's a mom pubis here. All right, this is a sagittal view of the female uh, internal organ. You have the skin, tummy fat, intestine, bladder, uterus, rectum, spine, and also your back. So this is the how it looks like during the laparoscopic surgery. This is a brown ligament, fallopian tubes, ovaries. All right, this is a side way how the um, cervix look like in real life, where when you put in a speculum, you should visualize the cervix. So, uh, hypothalamic pituitary action uh, exists. Actually, most of the endocrine uh, function is controlled by the brain, although pituitary is the master of gland. All right. So, this hypothalamus will secrete this gonadotropin releasing hormone, stimulate the pituitary to release the gonadotropin, such as luteinizing hormone and follicular stimulating hormone, which um, uh, in, in terms, uh, will, uh, the ovary will produce progesterone and estro estrogens. So during the first day of the period, towards the next, uh, next cycle, first day of the period, the whole period is termed menstrual cycle. It's divided in three phases, uh, follicular phase, ovulation, and post ovulatory phase or luteal phase. So during the first half of the follicular phase is a menstrual, uh, a menstrual phase also. So when this egg, during first day of the period, the, the ovary will collect about 20 to 30 eggs, but however, there's only one egg will grow to a mature size, then ovulation will take place. Like, uh, you know, the, the chicken eggs, uh, yes. that is released from the ovary uh, and follicles. When, if the sexual intercourse happens, the sperm will swim from the vagina into the uterus, into the fallopian tube where the eggs is fertilized. Uh, over the right lower end, uh, the, the ultrasound picture, this is the mature follicle looks like about 18 to 20 mm. So if the ovulation uh, takes place and there's a sexual intercourse, patient will likely to get pregnant. 
okay? You fertilize in the fallopian tube, take about five days to reach the uterus. If the uh, fertilized egg stuck in the fallopian tube, then we call it ectopic pregnancy. Then it take about seven days for the implantation to occur. So this is after uh, count from the first day of the period, the average pregnancy about 40 weeks. You count from ovulation, average of pregnancy is 38 weeks. So if the pregnancy doesn't occur, the lining of the endometrium will shed, then the bleeding start to occur and the next cycle of the menstrual cycle begin. So this is how the ultrasound of the uterus look like in the sagittal view. This is the bladder, the uterus. At the center there, the uterus is a bit big, uh, uh, which appear like adenomyosis. And uh, this, is, uh, this is the uterus. The white strip here is the endometrium. Uh, if you've got ultrasound, a lot of GP already have ultrasound. So if you have ultrasound, you can scan the kidney, you can scan the liver. At the, at the same time, you can scan the reproductive female organ also. So this is a vagina scan. If you have a vagina scan, you'll be an additional good point for GP to manage the uh, female, uh, female gynecological cases. This is the uterus, the lining here is very thin. That means the, at the beginning phase of the menstrual cycle, when the uterus uh, have three strips inside the uh, cavity, it indicate the uh, patient is actually near ovulation. When the, after ovulation, the lining inside become luteinized, become white in color, all right? So this is at the center here, this is the ovary. Inside this ovary, there's a lot of stuff. Pots hole, black pots hole here. This indicate the follicle inside the ovary. And uh, over the right side, there's a big follicle there in indicate maturity of the eggs. All right, if you see on the center right side, there's a lot of small, small, uh, there are a lot of eggs, about 10 of them. This is the IVF uh, the follicle. I mean, a stimulation we've done with gonadotropin. So how do you calculate a fertile period? First of all, your period must be regular. You take a three month average the first day, uh, the, the first day between the two menstrual cycles is your menstrual length, menstrual cycle length. So you minus 14 days from your first day of your menstrual cycle, then you will get your fertile, uh, your ovulation date. So no, normally it's retrospective. However, you can uh, take the LH test kit, urine LH test kit to increase the sensitivity. How, best time to have sex, 14 days. Uh, if you calculate three month average, 14 days before, uh, from the first day of your period, this is your no, any time is a good time. <laughs> so you can do an LH test kit. If you see two light, one faint, one light, then you can you know that the hormone is start to rise. When there's a two dark line, that means ovulation will occur in the next 24 to 36 hours. So you can the GP side or the general practitioner should also can take some hormones or manage some fertility cases also. Uh, for FSH, normally it's less than 10. LH also less than 10. Anything more than 10, it means the ovary has uh, not many eggs inside because there's a reduce in negative feedback. All right. So for, for progesterone, if the progesterone is more than 25 nano micromole per liter, that means ovulation is normally occur. Normally, seven days after the ovulation, uh, you test the, for the progesterone. FSH always normally test the day two, day three period where the hormone is low. High means the, the ovary, the pool has actually been reduced. So normally, um, normally the fertilizer happen in the fallopian tube. Uh, you can also do uh, HSG to check the tuber patency. You can, uh, the, the general practitioner should do that also. All right, you want to know whether there's a polyp, submucosal fiber, or there's a structural defect such as diadelphy, biconate uterus, and etc. So this is uh, how the hysterosophical gram looks like. All right, you can see that this is the, you know, the uterus cavity, like a triangle, which is normal. There's a small line here, which is the fallopian tube, which is not swollen. All right, if it's, so, if it's blocked, then you won't see the tracings. If it's blocked, then we come hydrosulfings. All right, if the cavity have a, um, hypoechoic lesion inside, most likely is either a polyp or submucosal fibroid. So this is how the sperm looks like. Uh, okay. Um, normally the testes have two functions, to produce testosterone and also to produce sperm. All right. Normally, semen analysis is done under a microscope. Um, total concentration about 50 million uh, in uh, the latest, um, latest reference. All right, total sperm is 39 million, progressive is 32%, mortality about 40%. Normally, the pH is alkaline, the morphology about 4%. All 
Uh, oligospermia means uh, uh, less than 50 million, within 10 to 15 million. Moderate uh, oligospermia, 5, 5 to 10 million. Severe oligospermia means less than 5 million. Uh, that means, first of all, you need to cal we will calculate the count, whether the sperm is good in mortality, all right? whether the, the, sh the shape and size of the sperm uh, is actually normal. So, um, however, male has no effective treatment for male infertility. Generally, uh, avoid wearing tight jeans, avoid persona, processed food, fast food, should quit smoking and alcohol, and uh, not, not quit your job because it's COVID. <laughs> uh, because the scrotum and, and the eggs are too near the, you know, the stove, sometimes it can be, uh, can be uh, I mean, the, the structure can be, <clears throat> can be affected. It can take some supplement, uh, selenium, and uh, as long as there's a sperm, uh, the treatment for male infertility is straightforward. So indication for ovulation induction, uh, normally end ovulation, for example, polycystic ovary, uh, ladies with irregular menses, unexplained infertility. What is the prerequisite for uh, giving ovulation induction agent? The following tube must be normal. The sperm analysis, male factors, which means the sperm is about 10 to 15 million. So ovulation induction normally take from day three until day seven for five days. If you take the clomid from 50 milligram daily to 150 milligram daily, Fimara, 2.5 milligram to 7.5 milligram daily. So you ask the patient to come back for scan. You can do a tummy scan. You can do a vagina scan. If you see a growing follicle, then, then uh, you can ask them to time the coitus or you can give uh, test SG, a pregnant and also the humor or hilcock uh, to, to induce the ovulation. Over the right side, the community citrate, the uh, mechanism of action is, it is actually selective estrogen modulator. And uh, for, the, uh, for the Fumara, it's actually aromatase inhibitor, uh, uh, inhibit conversion from androgen to estrogen. So there's a loss of negative feedback. So the pituitary will produce more uh, gonadotropin to stimulate the ovary to produce more eggs. So other tests you can do at the GP practice is you can do an anti murarian hormone. This anti murarian hormone is actually secreted by the young uh, follicles inside the ovary. So as you know that when the ladies age, the follicle inside the ovary become depleted. So the MH will start dropping, all right, uh, every year. So we want to know whether these ladies are in the normal range of uh, anti murarian hormone. So other than that, you can do a pesmia. You should do a mammogram because uh, fertility should not be the main uh, treatment on it. You should look at the female as a general uh, 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 well-being. Can do also infective screening, especially if quite IVF or IVF. So for ectopic pregnancy, normally there's a triad, period of amenorrhea, abdominal pain, and PV bleeding. On and off, the ladies will come with a, a positive urine pregnancy test. Uh, the last menstrual period may not be reliable. Sometimes they cannot remember, sometimes they didn't jot down, sometimes the period is irregular. So most of the time it's not reliable, all right? So majority have no obvious risk factor, history of ectopic pelvic surgery, pelvic inflammatory disease, endometriosis, took emergency contraception, smoking, and et cetera. You must have a high suspicious of in, index of suspicion. You must, uh, unless you see a gestation with a fetal echo and fetal heart activity, it is ectopic until proven otherwise. So it's necessary that you may repeat, need to repeat the ultrasound. If you see a hit beta hit CG, 1,005 to 2,000, you must see something. If you see the uterus is empty, uh, urine, urine pregnancy test is positive, hit CG is more than 1,005, then it's ectopic, all right? Sometimes you can see a pseudo sex inside the uterus. You can see a free fluid and exam mass. You can sometimes can even see the baby, uh, the, the gestational sex outside the uterus with the baby heartbeat. So you know that it's an ectopic pregnancy. This is to show you the uterus here. The endometrium lining is taken because of the hormone preg pregnancy hormone. However, you cannot see a sac. Uh, over the right lower side, you can see a pseudo sac. It's not a sac, it's just a fluid collection. All right. On the right upper image, you can see a gestational sac with a fetal echo inside. This is what you want to see. Most important thing is look for whether the uterus is whether empty, there's a sac or not sac, and fluid collection. If there is a fluid collection, the uterus is empty, then it's the time to refer. Otherwise, if you think the patient is stable, then you can just repeat the, another HCG. Maybe it's just a miscarriage. So for polycystic ovarian uh, syndrome, 
Um, normally, they have ladies with problem with weight gain, irregular menses, problem trying to get pregnant, excessive androgen, they got acne, they got hirsutism. Sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, they got a hair over the chest, or right, over the limbs, so excessive androgen. Normally, it's interplay between insulin resistant, hyperinsulinemia, hyperandrogen, and chronic end ovulation. According to Rotterdam criteria, you need two out of three to diagnose polycystic ovarian syndrome, oligo uh, or ovulation or end ovulation, hyperandrogenism, either clinical or biological. A uh, clinical, you look for hirsutism and uh, acne, and a biological, you look for uh, androgen free index uh, and testosterone level. So polycystic ovary can be visualized under vaginal ultrasound. You have 12 or more follicle, which the each of the follicle is between 2 to 9 mm, and the ovarian volume about 10. So 1 in 10 ladies will ha actually have polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, sometimes they may have, a, sometimes they are overweight, they may have high blood pressure and diabetes. So if the ladies are uh, put on weight, sometimes the period it become more irregular. If they if they reduce the weight, then the period become, they have done a study and claim that the, uh, the period become more regular. All right, this is, the, uh, this is the ultrasound for the polycystic ovary. There's a lot of small pots hole here. Uh, we in, if it's more than 12, that means this lady is likely to have polycystic ovarian syndrome. If you look at this animation here in the center, uh, you, they, you can see that there's a lot of small, small uh, follicle inside the ovary, which is not mature. Okay. On the other hand, if it's mature, if, it, if it's a normal ovary, you can there should be less than 10 uh, follicle there, and uh, all the follicle are uh, in a different stage of uh, uh, maturity. So for uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, no, previously there's a criteria, the LH is about two times the FSH, but this is no longer a criteria. LH and FH is normally high in polycystic ovarian syndrome. And uh, if you do ultrasound, there are a lot of small follicles inside the ovary. All right. On the other hand, if it's normal, then you can see the, the hormones, uh, gonadotropin and estrogen and progesterone, they are actually fluctuating uh, uh, most of the day. So uh, management-wide, good sleep, diet, uh, low carbs diet, control the diet intake, more fruits, more vegetable, uh, let's, uh, uh, less simple sugar, avoid processed food and fast food, control the weight, exercise because there's an increased insulin resistance. So you want to increase uh, the uh, insulin uh, uh, sensitivity. So other than that, avoid smoking, avoid alcohol. So treatment-wise for polycystic ovary, weight loss, exercise, diet, uh, you must at least have three to four times period per year. Uh, in order to reduce your risk of endometrial cancer. If the endometrium become thick and thicker, there's a risk that it undergo transformation and become cancerous and even develop polyps. So for those who are not keen for pregnant, you can actually induce the peri period with the uh, Povera, COCP, no atosterone. Uh, you also can give COCP to reduce the testosterone effect for the facial hair, exotism, acne. You can start Diane, Yas, Yasmin, and etc. All right, for hazardism wise, you can do shaving, waxing, electrolysis, laser, spinolactone, even bleaching. Fertility, if they are keen for fertility treatment, you can start metformin. You can give some uh, clomiphene or Fimara that I have spoken just now. Or uh, if this failed, you can refer to us for further fertility treatment. Also, prevention is also important for diabetes, high blood pressure, and also cardiovascular complication. Rarely they require laparoscopic ovarian drilling and also a bariatric surgery, that means uh, bypass the stomach. So Bartholin gland normally located about five and seven o'clock of the uh, east side of the vagina opening. It's a quick fluid that help to lubricate the vagina when the, especially during sexual arousal. Sometimes the opening can actually become obstructed due to hygiene purpose, sexual transmitted disease or ascending infection cause the fluid to accumulate back up to the gland and cause swelling. Normally, it's painless swelling called Bartholin cyst. So this is where the Bartholin located. So if, if you're at 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock, so if you're at this portion, highly suspect of Bartholin gland. So this is how the mastoblization is done. However, I don't encourage you, you to keep the Bartholin uh, cyst or Bartholin abscess because there's a higher risk of recurrence if the surgery is done in a GP setting. 
So you just open up the, the, the Bartolin. So you, you, you do a mass utilization, create a pocket at the gland. So the drainage can be come out directly from the Bartolin. So Bartolin uh, abscess, if the fluid be, uh, in the cyst become infected, there's a develop into a collection of pus around by the inflamed tissue. So patient may complain of fever, pain during walking, during intercourse, painful lung near the vaginal opening. So treatment, broad spectrum antibiotic. If it's not infected, if it's very small, so it can try conservative, all right? Um, at, uh, bacteria, anaerobes and aerobics bacteria, you can give some energetic after the, let's say you have done the, 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 the surgery, a simple surgery at your clinic, you should do a wound care and dressing, all right? If you think, uh, if you think that you cannot manage, you should do a referral. So labia abscess is where the hair punctum follicles become obstructed. Uh, this, this picture here is a baby that uh, there's an infrequent change of the diapers, but the follicle become blocked. So that uh, there's a blockage in the sebaceous gland and also the pores due to hygiene or ingrowth of hair, opportunistic infection, etc., leading to inflammation, infection then spread to the nearby structure and subcutaneous tissue. Uh, Treatment-wise, painkiller, NSAID, broad-spectrum antibiotic, antiseptic cream, and for labia, for labia abscess, this can be done in a GP setting. It's simple, recurrence uh, rate is actually quite low compared to the Bartolin uh, gland mobilization. So refer if patient is septic or the abscess ex extended into mom pubis, or the patient uh, has a lot of comorbid age, diabetes, high blood pressure, this is a case of heart disease, uh, you, this is a case that you want to make a referral. So for cause of uterine bleeding, uh, abnormal uterine bleeding, basically you use the palm coin uh, to assess the, 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 the cause. It is either can be a structural cause or non-structural cause. Structural cause can be the poly inside the uterine cavity, adenomyces, which I'm going to explain to you later, fibroid, uh, even magnilancy need to be considered. So especially they got abnormal uterine bleeding at 40 years old and above, this is a case you want to investigate or highly suspicious of endometrial cancer or even a, a cervical cancer. Um, or can be due to the bleeding disorder, undiagnosed bleeding disorder, or even cirrhosis, or, or patient is on the anticoagulant, et cetera. So can be due to ovulation dysfunction. In adolescent, the hypopituitary ovarian axis is not matured. So sometimes they can have an abnormal uterine bleeding or menorrhagia. Perimenopause, uh, because the, uh, the ovary have no longer have many eggs inside. So, so the, the, ovula uh, the ovulation can be dysfunction. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, hypothyroid, anorexia, at least. So other than that, uh, dysfunction uterine bleeding is the uh, uh, exclusion. All right, you must exclude other causes in order for you to diagnose dysfunction uterine bleeding. Other than this, iatrogenic hormonal contraception use, HRT, post surgery, this also can lead to abnormal uterine bleeding. Other than that, is the pelvic inflammatory disease, endometritis, cervicitis, and, and etc. So, how do you investigate ultrasound? So, ultrasound is very important if you, uh, you want to manage gynecological disease in a GP setting. Right? You can do a pap smear to rule out endo, uh, the cervical cancer. Ultrasound can rule out fibroid, endometrial polyps, uh, even ovarian cysts. So if you're 40 years old, uh, above 40 years old, I encourage you to do endometrial sampling or people sampling at your office. All right, if the people sampling is normal, you can rule out endometrial cancer. Then this patient, you can wait. All right, you can refer this patient later and see how is the response. If the patient responds well, you can keep it in your, at your clinic. If it doesn't respond well, then you should refer the case. Uh, this uh, hysteroscopy, endometrial ablation, myomectomy, and hysterectomy, this is a specialized procedure. Uh, if the patient requires this uh, procedure, you may need to do a referral. Dysfunction uterine bleeding is a diagnosis of exclusion. So for menorrhagia or abnormal uterine bleeding, treat the underlying cause. Discuss with the patient about your treatment plan, whether are they, uh, are they ready to accept what you offer. All right, uh, over the right side here, lower right side here, this is the PPEL. Um, there's an insert where you will withdraw, then it will create a vacuum. So you basically, you do it like a DNC. So you pass it inside the uh, cervical os and cervical canal into a uterus. You just take some sample. All right, maybe in a, a three, three to five uh, uh, attempt uh, to take some tissue and send to the histopathological examination. 
So treatment-wise for menorrhagia and normal uterine bleeding, iron supplement, transit naming acid antifibrotic to stop the bleeding. Methanamic acid also is good as a prostaglandin. Uh, you also can uh, uh, reduce the pain, reduce the bleeding. Uh, actually, the first line is actually Mirena. If you, uh, if you know how to put in the IUCD inside the uterus, then it will be good. Uh, if, you, if you have ultrasound, we can even do it under ultrasound guidance. All right. Other than that, you can start COCP, a simple COCP, Diane, Yasmin, Mercilon, Lloyd, etc. Sometimes uh, some, uh, some GP can start no atisteron or Povera. If the patient does not respond to your treatment, please refer. All right. Uh, avoid the gonadotropin releasing hormone antagonist or agonist. So endometrial polyps is actually excessive growth uh, of your endometrial tissue. Uh, you try polyps are the growth that attach to the inner wall of the uterus, overgrowth of the cell lining of the uterus, leading to formation of polyps. Most of the time, the polyp is not cancerous. However, uh, some of them, my, minority of them, will turn into cancer. So, sign and symptom of uterine, uh, uterine polyp, irregular menstruation, intermenstrual bleed. The, the menstruation is actually silent, prolonged, and heavy, and uh, can be excessive menstruation. Uh, vaginal bleeding after menopause, all right? Most of the time, it's asymptomatic, all right? Sometimes they do cause infertility because this polyp secretes some uh, toxin, uh, create an environment which is not suitable for implantation. So when you do ultrasound, then you can see that there's a mixed echogenicity inside the uterine cavity, indicate it may actually be a submucosal fibroid or polyp. You can even do a saline sonography if you want. Uh, put some free inside the uterine cavity. This one will help you to delineate the structure either of polyps or also submucosal fibroid, whether the mass arises inside the cavity or from the muscle wall. So this is how the polyp looks like. Normally, patients require hysteroscopy and polypectomy. So we can resect it, also can grind it. And we, can do also, we also do some curating. So risk factor are uh, perimenopause, but age of 40 to 50, patient having high blood pressure, obese, patient on tamoxifen uh, due to breast cancer, a therapy for breast cancer, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Problem with endometrial polyp, dysmenorrhea, menorrhagia, intermenstrual bleed, miscarriage, infertility, and also bleeding after menopause. The risk of cancer actually is very low. Uh, uterine fibroid is actually benign disease. It is an overgrown or a muscle cell inside the uterine, uh, uterine muscle. All right. So normally it happens in the reproductive age group. Majority is asymptomatic. Risk factor, obesity, family history of fibroid, nali paras, early malarkey, late menopause, uh, also exogenous, uh, endogenous hormone. So if you have, uh, if you have fibroid, uh, so there's one in 2,000 is become cancer. If the patient is symptomatic, one in 400 is a cancer. Most majority of the time, if it's more than 5 cm, likelihood of cancer is higher. If it's less than 5 cm, the likelihood of cancer is lower. So you try fibroid, the symptoms depend on the number of the fibroid, the size of the fibroid, the type and location of the fibroid. If you look at the right upper image, so there's a, you can see a submucosa which is inside the uterine cavity. Then this one will create a lot of heavy bleeding because the uterus not able to contract. There's a mass inside and the polyp can bleed on and off. All right, if it's uh, outside the uterus, it's pedunculated or subserosal fibroid. This one like, most likely will not cause problem unless it get twisted or infected. All right, if it's near the muscle wall, uh, sometimes it does cause a, a bit of miscarriage, uh, a, a he a heavy periods, abnormal line, and so on. Uh, okay, uh, so majority are actually asymptomatic. Majority just need to treat conservatively. If it's less than if it's around three cm, you can keep it inside the clinics. But symptomatic are menorrhagia, miscarriage, pressure symptom when the fiber have grown so big. It compresses on the bladder and also the rectum. Uh, or if the, the fiber becomes painful or very fast growing, then you have to suspect cancer. So investigation, full blood count if the patient having a, a menorrhagia, do an ultrasound to assess the size of the fibroid. Uh, SHG, if the patient is having an infertility or menorrhagia, uh, you suspect submucosal fibroid or polyp. All right, rarely patient require a CT scan or hysteroscopy. Normally, ultrasound should be sufficient. So medication, painkiller, uterine crystal has been withdrawn from the market due to because it caused liver failure. Other than that, you can start transcendental acid, some hormone therapy like COCP. Um, 
uh, Zoladex, Lucrin, uh, if they really need a perioperative medication to reduce the size of the thyroid before the operation from a, a laparotomy to laparoscopy, uh, from a bigger wound, from bigger wound to a smaller wound. So it helps us manage uh, the, uh, to shrink the fibroid. So normally the fibroid is done, uh, if it's a completed family, then we can do a hysterectomy. If the family is not completed, then we normally conserve the uterus. Either can be a fantasy or, or either can be a midline. Depends how big is the fibroid, where is the fibroid. Sorry, um, the, 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 the thing stuck. Okay, uh, other than that, we also can remove the fibroid through a laparoscopic surgery, uh, surgery. Rather than cutting up to down, side to side, we actually can um, remove the fibroid through a laparoscopic keyhole surgery. We can try, up, try to take out um, the fibroid uh, uh, through laparoscopy. So we, so we can actually take out the fibroid, put inside the bag, mosaic it, and take out from the laparoscopic keyhole wound. All right, we also can also do a hysterectomy to take out the fibroid from the vagina, all right, uh, rather than the traditional surgery. So other than that, you also can do a um, uh, uterine artery embolization. Uh, the indication are heavy menstrual bleeding, dysmenorrhea associated with the fibroid, premenopause. They have no desire to, uh, to have pregnancy because you embolize the, the, uh, the uterine artery. Then if patient pregnant, there will be a, a bitter growth restriction because there's not enough blood flow to the uterus and to the baby. Not suitable, uh, if, if the patient not suitable for surgery, then you can try, uh, we, can, uh, we can go for the uh, uterine artery embolization. So other than that, increased evidence of MRI guided high intensity focused ultrasound. These are good for single fibroid small fibroids, all right? Not multiple fibroids and big fibroids. So they focus the ultrasound, then create a heat to create a central necrosis. So the fibroid can shrink to 30 to 40%, up to 50%. So adenomyosis actually occur when the tissue on the, on the normal lining of the uh, uterus called endometrial tissue ingrow into the muscle wall. So during each menstrual cycle, uh, the displaced tissue in, uh, begin to bleed inflamed and thickened inside the uterine muscle, uh, result in enlarged uterus, painful period, heavy period, prolonged period, uh, this peroneal which is pain in us uh, during sexual intercourse and infertility. Why it causes infertility? Because the uterus no longer uh, receptive to the uh, implantation. Risk factor adenomyosis is uh, in mid 40s, uh, previous childbirth, especially cesarean section, uh, history of miscarriage require a DNC. As an endometritis or history of infection, this will create this will actually interrupt with the endometrial myometrial junction, create a, a risk factor for adenomyosis. So we can do ultrasound. You can see that the, the anterior wall and the posterior wall. Normally, the posterior wall is more, more, uh, most of most of the time affected. You can see the anterior wall actually is smaller compared to the posterior wall. If you look at the center, this is the endometrial strip, which is uh, hyperechoic in nature when during uh, the ultrasound, you can see that the hyperechoic lesion is actually inside the uterine cavity, just like a stone, uh, stand storm appearance or stone storm appearance. All right, okay, then you can see a white and a black background at the posterior wall. So, this is the MRI of the adenomyosis. You can see that uh, the, the wall here is actually thicker than the, compared to this wall here. Now, this is a set specimens of the adenomyosis. The uterus is enlarged. So, anti uh, treatment anti inflammatory drugs one to two days before the period begins, reduce the menstrual pain and also the menstrual flow. Anti fibroblastics such as fascinemic acid, hormone therapy, you can use COCP to reduce the bleeding and also the pain. Progesterone only contraception is not, um, it is not, um, how should I recommend that? Because if the period is irregular, you keep put a patient on progesterone, the period becomes more irregular. All right. If you want to know whether the hysterectomy is useful, then you can try a GNRH if, uh, if the hysterectomy is beneficial. If the pain is severe and no other treatment works, then this is the time for hysterectomy. So limited evidence of endometrial ablation, high intensity uh, focused ultrasound. 
So by doing this, the endometrium lining get destroyed by heat. Okay. Now we talk about ovarian cyst. Uh, ovarian cyst. This over, ovarian follicle, they are actually uh, germ cells. They have potential to become a baby or any cell. So there's, if there's uh, under a uh, situation where they are get stimulated, it can form a cyst, complex cyst, uh, endometrioma, dermoid cyst, uh, mucinous cyst, uh, ovarian tumor, and even cancer. So the risk factor are nariparous, delayed childbirth and pregnancy, fewer children, small family, uh, history of smoking, alcohol, pollution, uh, however, birth control pill has some protective effect. So, uh, you want to see whether patient, the tummy is distended. Uh, most of the time, it's asymptomatic. It's an incidental finding during the physical examination. Uh, there's a period pain, irregular menses, pressure symptom to the bowel and also the bladder. So, uh, when the mass becomes so big, it becomes rest of twisted, perforated, infected. All right. So th this is the ultrasound finding or the sympathesis. If this sympathesis is 3 to 4 cm, below 3 to 4 cm, you can keep the patient. You can give patient a try of the COCP, see whether uh, this uh, suppression can actually resolve the ovarian cyst or not. All right, if it's bigger than that, then you need a referral for the operation. So complex ovarian cysts such as endometrioma, this is due to the retrograde menstruation, hormonal, prob hormonal stimulation, metaplasia, immune dysfunction, apoptosis of suppression or genetic. That means there's a backflow of the menstrual blood with the endometrial cell back into the peritoneum. And this, peri this endometrial cell implant on the uterus, implant on the bowel, uh, implant on the ovary. When it invade into the ovary, it, uh, when the uh, menstruation starts, then this ovary will start to bleed, create a chocolate cyst or endometrioma. Normally, it causes pain, menorrhagia, and infertility. So uh, dermoid cysts, uh, when you do a scan, you can see a mixed echogenicity, then you can have solid and cystic mass. All right, majority of them, 90% is actually benign. So uh, investigation for ovarian cyst, ovarian tumor is actually, you do a tumor marker. If it's, if it's a mildly raised, you better refer. All right, other than if it's normal, you can keep the patient. Um, ultrasound. Simple cyst, you can manage by yourself. If it's complex, most of the time it's benign. However, sometimes it's very difficult to differentiate from benign from cancer. So for this case, it's better to refer. All right, you also can order a CT scan or can take a tumor marker if you plan to refer this patient. So treatment-wise for orient cyst, orient tumor, orient cancer, most of the time surgery. Cyst, uh, on, we only remove the cyst if you're more than 3 cm if the patient is symptomatic. All right, less than 4 cm normally will not uh, three to four cm normally will not operate. Ovarian tumor remove the womb, fallopian tubes, and ovary. Sometimes omentum. If it's a cancer, or hysterectomy also remove the womb, fallopian tube, ovary, omentum, lymph node. Sometimes patient require chemotherapy after that. So if it's not cancerous, then we can do a laparoscopic surgery where this capsule is opened up and the cyst has is removed. Then we can close back the um the 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 the, the, the space. So ovarian cancer require operation. Uh, normally THBSO, total hysterect abdominal hysterectomy, bilateral subingo ophrectomy, then we can do a, some uh, lymph node uh, excision. So this is my patient where we operated on for ovarian bilateral ovarian cancer. So uh, other topics are cervicitis, PID, cervical intraepithelial lesion, cervical cancer of vaginitis. I'm finishing soon. Uh, infection, uh, cervicitis means there's an infection on the cervix, most often bacteria and viral in origin. But, uh, service IT can result from common sexual transmitted infection such as gonorrhea, chlamydia, trichomonias, cyst, uh, HPV, even genital herpes. Normal and healthy bacteria in the vagina can be overwhelmed uh, by the unhealthy and harmful bacteria, for example, bacterial vaginosis. Other causes of inflammation or uh, service can, can be due to allergy, spermicide, uh, excessive doging, uh, allergy to condom, and etc. Irritation from the tampon, uh, also so. Sign. Abnormal discharge, vagina bleeding, after, uh, uh, in, in intercoitus bleeding or intermenstrual bleeding, postmenopausal bleeding, pain during sex, difficult, difficulty and painful urination. All right, uh, abdominal and pel uh, pelvic pain, uh, sometimes fever, you must suspect pelvic inflammatory disease. Here, there's a discharge from the cervix. So, risk factor, multiple sex partner, early exposures, debut. Uh, uh, during teenage age, unprotected intercourse, smoking, alcohol, drugs, diabetes, or immunocompromised. How do we prevent PID? How do we prevent cervicitis? 
early treatment, all right, early recognition, uh, sexual, uh, sexual education, health, good health care, and higher education actually can delay a sexual exposure, limit the sexual partner, condom, treat the partner, child protection and statutory rape wrong, uh, uh, women shelter, engage empower women, and uh, also uh, law enforcement on the drug usage. Screening and prompt treatment, immunize for the survivor, uh, HPV to prevent cervical cancer. So complication, endometritis, serpingitis, ufractis, uh, tubal ovary abscess and pelvic inflammatory disease. Uh, these are due to the extending infection from the lower genital tract uh, from the chlamydia, gonorrhea, mycoplasma. Most of the time it's polymicrobial. That means there's more than two bacteria of, of causes. So treatment for PID, uh, most of the time patients will present with abdominal pain, fever, vaginal discharge, and most of the time they are sexually active. Uh, it, it, normally they are unwell. There's a tenderness in the lower abdomen and, and nexa if you do a vaginal examination. Cervical motion can be <coughs> positive. Vaginal discharge service may be inflamed. Uh, there's an increase in total white ESR C reactive protein. You can take a swab, can do a urine PCR, and you should do an ultrasound. Look for mixed echogenic mass, that means tubal or rare abscess, pyoselfing, and also pelvic collection. This is the fluid inside the endometrial cavity. Uh, at the second here, there's a, uh, the, the, the fallopian tube become, uh, become hydrosulfing, where there's a food collection there. And the, and the lower one uh, image, uh, that means there's a tubal ovarian abscess here. So outpatient, you can, you can treat them as outpatient. We assess them after 48 hours, uh, include symptomatic treatment, antipyretic, painkiller, anti-inflammatory, screen for STD, treat their partner also. For severe and tubal ovarian abscess, they need a referral. Um, if they are, especially when they are septic, they are unwell and they doesn't respond to your treatment. Uh, refer if they are, there's a free freak and collection, look hard for tubal ovarian abscess. If there's no tubal ovarian abscess, you can treat them for PID, no problem. Or sometimes we require intravenous antibiotic. Conservative most of the time, rarely require surgical drainage and excisions of the tubal ovarian abscess. So antibiotic-wise, broad spectrum because it's also anti multimicrobial and need to cover aerobic and anaerobic. Most of the time, you can give cetrizone 500 mg stat. You can give doxy and flagyl for 14 days with azithromycin 1 gram stat. Some GP can also can give gentamicin if you want, you can add, add gentamicin. Or you can want, uh, you may want to stop the cetrizone if once the patient become better, all right? Other choice antibiotic, uh, ampicillin salbactam, six hourly, but this is more hospital care, clindamycin 900, uh, 900 AV, uh, TDS, gentamicin, but this is more hospital regime. Uh, other than that, do an infective screening, HIV, hepatitis, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia. Also, you can do a HPV Watts um, uh, uh, investigation. Um, other than that, herpes simplex like trichomoniasis. So for cervical cancer, same risk as the cervicitis. Cervical cancer happen because of the persistent human papilloma virus infection. And this infection causes the cervical uh, transformation zone, uh, the cell there to transform uh, uh, because they are active. So once they're infected, the, the, the infection persists, then they cause cervical intraepithelial uh, neoplasia or lesion. These are precancerous lesions. All right, if they are left alone, uh, about five to 10 years time, they become cancer. The, the, the diagram here shows that this is a normal cervix. There's a CIN1, CIN2, and CIN3. Most of the CIN1 and 2, they can revert to normal. Uh, it's unlikely that CIN3 become uh, uh, revert to normal. All right, if you leave it alone, the patient may have cancer later on. Uh, cervical cancer is actually preventable. No women should die from cervical cancer. Actually, this, uh, most of the time, cervical cancer uh, peak at the 40 years old. Incidence is 11 to 30 in 100,000. Uh, a lot of Chinese, more, more prevalent in Chinese compared to Malay and also Indian because of the sexual practice and they have more sexual partner. All right. Majority of our ladies here in Malaysia, two-thirds is actually presented at a late stage, stage two and above. Most of the time, when you compare to the overseas, European, UK, and also US, they present earlier than us uh, to the doctors. Right? It associates with morbidity and mortality. So, um, so the sign and symptom of the cervical cancer is abnormal vagina bleeding, such as bleeding after sex or uh, uh, intermenstrual bleeding, post-coital bleeding, post-menopausal bleeding, abnormal discharge and pain during sex. 
difficulty and painful urination, uh, pelvic abdominal pain. When they have pelvic abdominal pain, that means uh, uh, they have dysuria, that means the cancer must have spread outside the cervix. So this is to show you that this is the virus that actually attacks the transformation zone. Then in the wrong line, then this uh, CIN1 or 2 and 3 become cancer. That's a, uh, that's a mess here. When the time they become necrotic, they will have a, a post bleed, intermenstrual bleed, and also abnormal discharge. Then after they spread to the uh, surrounding bladder, rectum, and also nearby lymph nodes, and metastasize to liver. So HPV has been implicated uh, High risk, they cause can most likely to cause cancer. Low risk, it is more towards warts. However, some low risk HPV can be associated with uh, cervical cancer. 99.7% of the cervical squamous cell cancer uh, is associated with HPV infection. On the other hand, adenocarcinoma or cervix are also related to HPV, but the correlation is less pronounced and is also age dependent. In women, Younger than 40 years old, HPV was, pre was present in 89% of the adenocarcinoma, where in women less uh, more than 60 years old and older, HPV observed is only 43%. So HPV is associated with cervical cancer. All right. So we can also give vaccine. This is the first generation of Gardasil, second generation of Gardasil. Cervarix only covers 16 or 18. This is not recommended. Um, other than that, um, other than that, this is a, there are hundreds of subtypes of the HPV, all right, but uh, only a number of them, 20, about 20 of them cause cervical cancer and warts. All right, but, um, other than that, it causes cervical cancer, anal cancer, vulva cancer, and throat cancer. If there is the anal genital wart, you can give Aldara. Or you can give podophyllotoxin, but I cannot find a polyphotodicin most of the time. I'm so sorry. Okay. Or you can do laser to remove the warts. Also, can do excise them. All right. Uh, how you, okay, normally, if you do have the, uh, uh, let's say GP don't do PESPIA, right? If you want to think of doing a PESPIA, this is the way you should do a PESPIA. First of all, you, you tell the patient, you get them ready. Uh, you show them this, uh, maybe you can show them this light. Then you actually need to part the labia. So, the, so when you insert the specular, you will not cause pain. All right. So normally you insert directly into the uh, 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 vagina. Then you can visualize the cervix. And this is the cytobrush. Then actually, uh, this is the side view of the, of, the, of the uterus and also the cervix. All right. Normally the, you need to take the endocervical cell also. All right. In order to have the good uh, sample. All right, normally is the, the examination is done through a microscope. All right, okay. Uh, this is to show you uh, the normal cell, CIN1 and CIN2 and CIN3, but this is, uh, we can skip this. So for cervical cytology and histological term, uh, ESCA stands for atypical squamous cell or undetermined significance. Uh, HS, HCH is atypical squamous cell that cannot exclude hyperplasia, uh, a high risk, or low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion or high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. AIS stands for adenocarcinoma in situ. AGC stands for atypical glandular cell. Uh, then you have a histology, CIN1, CIN2, and CIN3. So uh, when you talk about Pitasda, then it is, uh, we talk about the cytology. Then we talk about Rushat, we talk about the, the, the histology. So PESMIA, normally the screening is free or with minimal fees. You can go to Clinic Kesehatan. Uh, sometimes the Stokso or NGO does subsidize. Reason why people are not doing, personal reason, logistic, financial problem. Maybe they are shy. Maybe the, it, costs, it costs pain. All right. Uh, this is a report from the fact sheet cancer from the Malaysia 2018. Uh, it only show that only 22% of ladies uh, only participate between uh, uh, in, in the survival screening age between 20 in, uh, uh, to 65. All right. Uh, treatment for vaginal cancer, prevention is better than cure, HPV vaccine, uh, survival screening. A lot of people are actually uh, engaged in co tests that means they're doing the HPV screening with a PESMIA together. All right. This is what we, the, we will do a leads for the survival lesion. 
Uh, this is called LLETZ, where you remove the abnormal CIN cell and tissue. Rarely they require operation, chemotherapy, and radiotherapy. Uh, treatment, surveillance, vaccination, coposcopy, uh, hysterectomy before they turn into cancer, and were times if they are already survival cancer, chemotherapy, and radiotherapy. So uh, age group to be screened, uh, normally 25 years old and above. 25 to 29 years old, you do a cervical cytology once every three years. Why don't do HPV? Because young patients, they're able to get rid, eradicate the HPV virus themselves. Uh, 30 to 69 years old, you can do a HPV alone or you can do a cold test all right, every three to five years. Uh, you can discharge them if they're three consecutive negative cytology, uh, if they're above 69 years old or they have two consecutive HPV tests uh, last 10 years or if they have a negative cold test for the last 10 years. All right, if they're CIN1, CIN2, CIN3 and AIS, then you should continue follow up for the next 20 years. Women who have never had sexual intercourse before, women, uh, women who have never had sexual, uh, sexual intercourse before, who don't need to engage in the screening. All right, uh, this is according to 2019 guideline. Uh, cool test, you can repeat three to five years. Uh, refer if the HPV, refer to a gynecologist if the HPV is positive and the smear is abnormal. Refer if the HPV is high risk, 16 and 18, even though the pet smear is normal. Three, number three, abnormalities, minor abnormalities, uh, no HPV 1690s, you, you can keep most of the time it's atypical squamous cell or undetermined significance. You repeat the core test in one year. If you repeat the test, HPV is positive or the abnormal, the smear is abnormal, then you should refer. So refer if unsure, atypical glandular cell, low or high risk squamous inter epithelial lesion, carcinoma in situ and cancer. For vaginal discharge, uh, vaginal discharge may be a normal physiology occurrence or pathological manifestation. Uh, normal physiological discharge changes with uh, phases of menstrual cycle. The, correct, the character of the discharge tend to be clear, stretchable, and also clear in consistency during ovulation, become thicker, white, and slightly yellow during the luteal phase. Uh, normal healthy discharge are clear to uh, yellow, white. All right, they are not itchy, no discomfort, no swelling, no redness, no sign of inflammation, does not, does not have a strong odor. Especially this uh, vaginal discharge, uh, clear discharge is normally happen in those with high states of estrogen during ovulation, luteal phase, puberty, pregnancy, uh, sometimes patients on COCP and also HRT. Normal vaginal discharge is found in 10% of patients presented with vaginal discharge. So abnormal discharge, change in color, volume, consistency, and a lot adult may be associated with symptoms such as itch, soreness, dysuria, pelvic pain, intermenstrual bleed, post bleed, and patient tell you, doctor, it's a, not a normal discharge. Abnormal vaginal discharge is most commonly caused by infection. Most of the time, it's vagina vaginosis is the most common and account for about 50% of all infection. Next is a vulva vaginal candidiasis, account for 25 to, uh, 20 to 25% of the patient. All right, trichomoniasis, 15 to 25%. That means this, if you can guess about this infection, these are the main culprit, vagina vaginosis, uh, candidiasis, trichomoniasis. All right. Other than that, you have non infectious, which account for 5 to 10 percent. They are atopy, allergy, or irritant or inflammatory in nature, can be due to the tampon, pets, condom, spermicide, toys, sexual preference, pessary, detergent, bubble bath, and etc. etc. Sometimes radiotherapy, bacchytherapy, autoimmune, or also some anti estrogen medication. So, this is to tell you that clinical features associated. Uh, with the three common causes of the vagina discharge. For bacterial vaginosis, most of the time, the discharge is thin, bubbly, fishy in the door. Uh, there's no discomfort or itch, uh, no inflammation over at the outside genitalia, and the pH is more than 4.5. If, if, if you can do a pH study in your clinic, that will be good. All right. So if a pH is more than 4.5, it can be either vaginal bac uh, bacterial vaginosis or trichomoniasis. All right. If you do a microscopy, there could be a clue cell. Uh, if the patient is sexually active uh, for the past three months, if there's a change in partner in last two partner in six,
six months, then you can you should do a STD screening. There's no need to do a retesting because uh, some of them is a common cell. So uh, you do not need to treat the partner. If you have trichomoniasis, most of the time the, the, the disha is scanty, profuse, proti, maybe green or yellow in nature. They are most of the time offensive. Maybe there's an itch in vulva, uh, this peroneal discomfort. They cause vaginitis and also vaginitis. There's also called something called strawberry uh, cervix, where there's a disquamations on the cervix. Then it, uh, they call a uh, strawberry cervix. I'll show you the picture later. All right. Then in a microscopy, you can do a, see a mortal trichomonad. All right. Uh, if there's a trichomoniasis, you need to screen for HIV and also STDs. So vulva vaginiasis is there's a thick, whitey, curdy, discharge more of the time is itchy. And there's a, also inflammation. You also look for facial satellite lesions. And the pH is less than 4.5. All right. If you do have microscopy, no problem. Uh, if there's no uh, lab, uh, lab service, no problem. You just do a pH, vagina pH. All right. So atrophic vaginitis is due to many uh, estrogen deficiency in, perimen uh, in a menopausal patient. Uh, there's a clean, uh, clear discharge, vagina dryness, dysperonia. And when you examine them, then you look, you look at the vagina. It looks like the, the wall is thin and somewhat friable and also red. All right. So irrit uh, irritants and allergic uh, vaginitis, con there's a contact irritants and also there's a burning sensation, soreness and the vulva erythema. Uh, inflammatory most of the time is autoimmune, can be associated with low uh, estrogen level. All right, sometimes they do have some discharge, dyspareunia. Uh, also when you examine them, there's a vaginal atrophy. So bacterial vaginosis is an anaerobic bacteria, Ganyrella vaginosis, uh, uh, mobilucum, and also, this is also micro, uh, poly, uh, microbial infection. Uh, gram is variable. Normally, you can actually do an MSL diagnostic criteria. Uh, most of the time, um, uh, uh, most of the time, the, the, the discharge is thin, homogeneous. All right, you can, uh, there's a positive whiff test when you put the potassium hydrochloride 10%. There's a MI smell, like a urine. All right, there's a clue cell on the microscopy, and then there's a vaginal pH more than 4.5. Right. Sometimes what I do is I do a pap smear instead. I can know that whether the cervix is normal. Sometimes pap smear do tell me there's a shift of flora, uh, which is suggestive of bacterial vaginosis. And this in, uh, bacterial vaginosis, there's an increased risk of PPROM, also p term labor. Uh, clue cell is actually a cell that uh, on the epithelial tower and here uh, by the gram negative rods. So treatment, metrodidazole 400 mg. Uh, BD for seven days, intravaginal gel, clindamycin, metrodazole gel, alternative, clindamycin oral. If it's recurred, you can use the same regime or you can use the metrodazole uh, cream or gel, 0.75% twice per week for four to six months. So, vulva vaginal kinesis, most of the time the discharge is cheesy, curdy, foculent discharge. There's an itch in over the uh, vulva. Uh, lack or adult, if you put a hydro, uh, potential hydroxide preparation, you can see budding and also pseudo, pseudo hyphae. This is the budding on the, uh, on the candida species. All right, this is the hyphae. Uh, sometimes they do cause vulva vagina candiasis. All right, the pH is less than 4.5, which is acidic. You can also do culture. Pat smear do, do tell me that uh, there's a uh, vulva vagina. Uh, 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 well, uh, vagina candidiasis. All right. So most of the time, candidiasis you can treat them with fucronazole 100 mg. If it's severe, uh, you can give three dose every three days. Uh, day one, day four, day seven. You can give topical cortrimazole, miconazole, and etc. If it's recurrent, you can give fucronazole uh, 150 mg daily, seven to fourteen days. Then weekly for six months. Then the has been sure to relieve the patient for almost one year. If they don't respond, do a culture. It can be non albicans species, which is less as responsive to fuconazole. non albican is a non albican first line therapy is either, uh, most of the time, it's non fuconazole agent. It can be imidazole, iconazole, cotrimazole, miconazole, and etc. They are effective in eradicating the non albican uh, candidiasis. All right. Uh, most of the time, if pregnant, you can only use topical because they can cause miscarriage and also malformation. There's no clear evidence of probiotic in the in case of vaginal candidiasis. Trichomoniasis, 
And most of the time it's due to STD. You can do in a wet mount microscopy, you can see a protozoa. Uh, gold standard is still PCR. La. All right, you can do a pet smear. There's an increased risk of STD and HIV. You need to treat the partner, they can cause preterm labor. Uh, you can treat them with a single dose of metronidazole. All right, you need to retest them whether the patient is fully treated, uh, uh, normally after 28 days. Non-infectious, you treat the underlying cause, avoid the provo uh, provoking factors. If it's atrophic vaginitis, you can, you can give them HRT, uh, you can do give them primarine cream, and, uh, and also, wait. Uh, also, you can also give lubrication with the hyaluronic acid there, which increase the, uh, the water content inside the vagina. Okay, so they reduce the uh, uh, dyspareunia. Other than inflammatory wise, for example, uh, 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 the, uh, the, the, uh, the wawa, the wawa there's, uh, there's an increased pruritus wawa. You can use steroid and also clindamycin cream. I think that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much. I myself have never done a obstetric or gynecologist as a doctor. I It's something that I'm really scared of. I, I do not know how to even feel the oars. I So I really think that, um, yes, this is a really overview uh, and we get the whole picture of all the common diseases so we will start with some question i think mushana Tafa asked uh, dr tan ovarian drilling is rarely required but when is it required and other options when after all other options have failed can it okay. be done earlier uh, when the patient not responding to gonadotropin that means the hormone fsh lh through the ivf uh, injection, uh, or um, they have a very strong andro, uh, hyperandrogenism, then you may require to do ovary drilling. You do ovary drilling, so you actually destroy the tica cell inside the ovary. The, uh, the, the ovary. So this tica cell actually produce androgen. So you also reduce the amount of uh, the amount number of pool of eggs inside the ovary. They for the last uh, last twenty years, uh, for the past twenty years, they do uh, veg recession, we cut off quarter of the ovary, all right? So they reduce the egg pool inside the ovary. So the ovary can be normal in number, all right? Okay. Sometimes if it's ovary during, you overdo, you put many holes. So sometimes patient can actually go into uh, diminished ovarian reserve. So because most of the uh, eggs have been destroyed by your laparoscopy ovarian drilling. Okay. I have a question. Uh from Facebook, um, Amy asked, she was on metformin for PCOS and after eight years managed to get pregnant induced by Clomid. Mm. Okay. After giving birth, her period has been very regular, but the cycle is getting longer. From 30 days now, it's went up to 36 days and weight is also increasing. Should she consider to take metformin again? Yes, you should have uh, engaged back in the um, general management, weight loss exercise, then metformin to increase the in insulin sensitivity. All right. Then when, the, uh, when in that case, patient may have a, a spontaneous ovulation, uh, even without any medication. Uh, all right. If, if without spontaneous ovulation, if patient is still not pregnant, maybe she can tie some clomiphene all right, if the clomiphene or femara fail, then can, she can just move on with the gonadotropin. That means uh, uh, menopia, th those medications to stimulate the ovary to produce more eggs. Okay, I've shared the QR code. So you, for the QR code to work, you must be watching on a laptop and scanning it with your, your handphone. If you're watching it from the handphone, it will not uh, be useful. But if you can't get um, scan the QR code, if you can't scan the QR code, then please message me uh, on WhatsApp. I will give you my number and uh, we will do it manually for you. So you will need to send me your name, your MMC and your IC number and your email address. 
Um, we go on to the next question. Ku Yusuf asks, in DUB, for DUB in GP practice, I use hormonal treatment, premolate. How okay. many cycles do we need to give patients? How many what? How many cycles? All right. If they respond well, they will be good. Uh, from 5 milligram to 10 milligram. Uh, normally, uh, normally, you can give every three weeks, then you stop one week cyclical. All right. The, actually, the best one is still Mirina. You can put it under ultrasound or you can even start the COCP. So, uh, okay. If uh, After COCP or no cooler, if the period is still heavy, then you can add in some transinemic acid. All right. Okay. If the if you do a pesmia, you should do an ultrasound. All right. Uh, if the pesmia is normal, ultrasound is normal, then it's okay. If they're above 40 years old, then it's better to take the uh, PPL sampling endometrial biopsy, the one, the catheter that I show you, just to take some sample, just make sure it's not endometrial CA. Uh, okay. Uh, then you can do whatever you want. You want, you want to give Mokulo, you want to give COCP. All right, that's fine. All right. Okay. Another question is Haiza asked, how thick is the endometrial thickness for us to be alarmed? Previously, it was 1.1. Does that still apply? Uh, if it's more than 20, it, it okay, depends on the age. If it's meta, menopause, it should be less than 5 mm. All right. If it's a pre-menopause, it can be up to 20 mm. There's no problem. All right. Okay. However, if the patient already has risk factors such as polycystic ovarian syndrome, obesity, history of cancer, on tamoxifen, uh, and so on and so forth. If it's a more, if the period is heavy, right, the endometrium is thick, uh, even 20 and be, uh, I'll be alarming. This kind of cases, is better to do an office PPL sampling, then you, you can manage accordingly. If the PPL is normal, then you can start COCP. Okay. Uh, I think we have... Um... Haiza also asked, in teenagers with menarche, it's, it's less than two years and complain of uh, irregular bleeding. Is it necessary to do any ultrasound pelvic? Uh, most of the time, it appears not regular, right? It's, it, it's due to the uh, hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis, which is not matured. Most of the time, the pelvic scan will be normal. All right. However, unless there's a you are suspicious when you examine the tummy, there's a mess. All right. Then you probably want to do a scan. All right. Or they complain of painful period, or they complain of something else. Then it's better to engage with the ultrasound scan. Actually, I initially I want to talk about ultrasound in gynecology, but but I, I already over time. So I will actually select few clips from the YouTube we are share with you, which which I think may be helpful in the general practice. All right, later our admin will share the link. Then you can actually watch the video. Then what, what, uh, how to scan the uterus, how to scan the ovary, uh, how to scan the endometrium lining. Um, okay. I think, um, yeah, I can also share the link on our group chat. So if you are not with us on the group chat, uh, please join our Telegram group chat. We can share it there. Um, if... Ashini asked if routine peps, a very fruitful, if routine pap smear for 30 plus shows inflammation, how do we treat? All right, as long as there's no dysplasia, CIN1 or CIN2 or CIN3 or in glenuda, uh, glenuda, a typical glenuda cell, then uh, you either can take a swab or can give a, uh, you can try a antibiotic. All right, uh, if it's just inflammation, sometimes uh, they tell you, uh, uh, indicate of repair, indicate of this uh, healing, then you, you, you don't be bothered. If you want, you can take a um, HPV, HPV virus subtype. All right, if the HPV is normal, then you just leave it alone. Okay. Right. I think we will need to stop here. Uh, and the reason is also because um, I have to rush into the hospital. <laughs> I'm so sorry. So uh, thank you very much, Tan. I think it's been a very interesting talk. Very, um, what? Um, a lot of pictures to illustrate. Okay. So easy for people like me to understand. 
But I want to ask you last question. The most I, I talk to many topics. Sorry? Mosolation. Do you believe mosolation, in mosolation? Yes, Do you believe in mosolation? All right. Okay. Uh, this mosolation, uh, uh, they, they ban mosolation because there's a one case in US where yes. they mosolate the, the fibroid and it was found to have this uh, sarcoma. So it actually, when they, when they mosolate some of the tissue, they spread into other parts of the peritoneum. All right. They claim they worsen the condition. Whether or not uh, this patient have a poor prognosis, when you talk about sarcoma, all right, okay. Uh, also recommended to mosolate inside the back. Also mosolate if the fiber less. Uh, uh, you only can mosolate if the fiber less than five cm. Okay, the reason I ask is because I had sarcoma. Okay. It was misdiagnosed as fibroid, and uh, and. When uh, two years down the road, uh, it was actually found at in on my small bowel, um, attached to a lot of the omentum. Right. Yeah. So I so, had. Uh, so there's uh, another way of uh, what mosolation is. You can do a copotomy. That means cut the part of the vagina from the from the laparoscopy and take out from the vagina uh, outlet. All right, or you can put inside the bag, mosolate inside the bag. All right, if it's more than 5 cm, we prefer not to mosolate. It's better to do a lapratomy to take out the fibroid. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I see you guys. Next week, we have another webinar. I think uh, it's on genetic counseling. I will share the, um, the details later. You can register. And happy Malaysia Day and happy holiday tomorrow. Okay, bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Tan.